Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. And welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with Professor Elaine Hybe, neurosurgeon Dr. John Turner, and research historian Mr. Michael Tim about the channel material in the book 47 Billion Years of Evolution. But before we get back to the show, I want to invite you to join me on Facebook. I post regularly everything from where I am and what's on next to the latest in science, technology, and consciousness studies, and from time to time, some of my own opinions about the world we live in. And I love your comments and feedback, and Facebook is a great place for that. So please give me a like and join me at facebook.com forward slash Dr. Eldon Taylor, that's D-R-E-L-D-O-N-T-A-Y-L-O-R. Okay, before our break, uh, Professor Hybe, uh, you had just put your reputation on the line. Everything in this book is credible, so let's take on the specificity of the book, the contents of the book, all right? I have to ask, you know, there are three volumes. I know you've only edited on one, but what is the overall abiding message what what are these volumes attempting to communicate uh well they're part of a larger uh worldwide plan that mike can uh verify has been going on for at least 150 years and this is you know the source does experiments buddha was one uh jesus was another uh this experiment involves uh, an enhancement of people's psychic abilities and permission for uh, entities, spirits, to materialize to individuals they believe will uh, publish and, and share their teaching. And they call it the K plan. That's why there's a K on the cover. Uh, the entity K is overlooking these committees, over managing these committees and giving permission when materialization is uh, deemed to be a positive experience to the sitters involved. You so define I, that as a revolution against negativity. Is, right. is that correct? That's, okay. That's the, how they define it. All right. Negativity. I mean, were we talking about, uh, you know, I don't feel good negativity? Uh, negativity? Are we talking about you dummy wrong negativity? Are we talking about, um, what, Crimea negativity? Uh, the way the world is seeing each other? What, yeah. what do we mean by negativity? Negativity uh, means that individuals have lost touch with their uh, inner soul and their intuition and their spiritual aspects. Uh, and there's loss being open to impingement from entities from spirit. So the negativity is partly becoming so materialistic to be out of touch with one's nature, uh, and that uh, the way society has trained us, especially organized religion, has been uh, unnatural fear and its derivatives of guilt and shame. So negativity in terms of a negative view of self, the world, uh, the future, uh, negativity and being uh, self-centered as a separate person rather than realizing we're all interconnected and what you do to others, you do to self. Uh, negativity and being out of touch with the universal laws of natural behavior of which they listed uh, 10 explicitly, but really I came across a count of 21. So really? for people to li live in a more natural, rhythmic life where they balance their intellect with their emotions, uh, their spiritual aspects, and their physical aspects. These are out of balance. People are too intellectual. They react to their emotions instead of act upon them. They express unnatural emotions. The entities listed five. I'm happy to go through them if there's time. Uh, that uh, to become rhythmic, if you're in touch with uh, all those four aspects of personality, intellect, emotion, your physical body, and your spiritual aspect, you'll be balanced. So negativity is being out of balance. And Please. perhaps having a conscious mo motive to harm people, to compete, survival of right. the fittest, 
instead of cooperating, that we're all interconnected. We like everything to come down to a pragmatic level. So okay. we have the idea of unconditional love, and, and we have the idea that, you know, whatever you do unto the least of thy brethren, you know, as the good book says, you have done unto the body of whatever you hold to be sacred or holy, including yourself. So let me ask you this. Uh, you read a story or you see where someone is abused, seriously abused. You know, there was a, a popular story uh, not long ago about a 14-year-old girl who in Pakistan had been sold by her father to uh, a, a husband who became displeased with her because she failed to please him. So he cut her nose and her ears off, cast her out to the stable, um, where she crawled back to her parents' home and they would have nothing to do with her because she had disgraced them. And a part of me, I must admit, met this story with a great deal of enmity. I guess that would mean I'm not very spiritual then, because according to that definition, uh, wouldn't I, you know, wouldn't I find some way to love this or is... Is loving um, that which is unacceptable, is that a part of what you're trying to tell us is out of balance? Okay, first of all, unconditional love is not liking. It's respecting that every human being has a soul that comes from the source. We're all equal. So to accept unconditional love means you accept this, this man who has such a distorted you, this father, he's so distorted, he is it's miserable, personally, or he wouldn't act out like that. Your anger is positive if it motivates you to act upon uh, trying to prevent something like this happening or help people who are victims okay. of something like that. Positive anger will last. 10 or 15 seconds because it motivates you to overcome something you don't like. If you fall into hostility, that's an unnatural emotion, and you'll be miserable. Okay. So anger, uh, positive anger, as you define it, is a part of unconditional love, and that is indeed my question. It's a natural emotion. Um, so, yeah, it is. Okay. There's other emotions connected if you want me to list them for others. Uh, you're more than welcome to. I don't want to cut you off at okay. all. Okay. Okay. So unconditional love is the major one. I think Bobby was sort of saying she felt that when she said her issues felt resolved. Mm -hmm. uh, so natural love is unconditional. It's not liking. Uh, and natural anger, as I already talked about. Uh, natural grief shows our interconnectedness, that you're sad of losing something that you love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, natural fear uh, is the self-protection of the physical body. Unnatural fear involves creating neuroses, guilt, shame. It's very unhappy. And then there's a final emotion they talk about, uh, which they term jealousy which is the desire to emulate and be creative, being inspired by others. Uh, envy is the unnatural part of it, where you want to destroy someone uh, that has something you would like to have. Uh, it, reiterate again, if you would, I must have missed it. What is the positive part of jealousy? positive part of jealousy is the desire to emulate, imitate okay. others. Okay, emulate. And right. become creative and grow yourself. Uh, most people use it, jealousy, when they really mean envy. Uh, so jealousy is a natural emotion. It is one reason we're inspired to uh, meet goals and pursue our purpose of life, which is another major message of the entity. And may I go on to that? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I'm not going to um, cut you off. You go ahead and flesh out this decide. whole thing. Yeah. Okay. They You're decide. the professor. I'm just, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the talk okay, host. I'm sorry, I'm over to talk to you. Uh, they, they introduced this to seven levels 
of evolution. And the first is incarnating. And the, before each and every incarnation, we uh, create a life plan, what they call a government of life. And this is our purpose for that particular incarnation. So we'll have intuitive sense to do things that we didn't logically deduce to do uh, that will move us towards that government of life. Uh, we'll have intuitions, we'll be impinged by our spirit guides and our dreams, sudden thoughts that pop into our head, you know, we didn't logically deduce them. That feeling will direct us to try to fulfill the reason for this particular incarnation. We chose our parents, we chose our own physical body, and we chose, uh, of course, the, where the parents live, the environment, what challenges that environment imposes for us to pursue our particular purpose for that particular incarnation. And each incarnation has different goals, of course, toward uh, the depths of evolution, uh, goals to live a ryth rhythmic life that I described before and expressing natural emotions. Mm -hmm. um, if I can add one more point, when uh, uh entity, a spirit, chooses a physical body to endow, uh, they understand uh, that the physical body is designed uh, to differ in dimensions that will sound familiar from Carl Jung's work. Uh, physical bodies are designed to be either introverted or extroverted, Introverted being more uh, uh, inclined intuitively, and extroverted more relying, of course, on the physical environment. So they choose to be introverted or extroverted, and they choose whether their physical personality will be primarily uh, leaning towards thinking or feeling. So let's say uh, empathy uh, once has had past incarnations where they express their emotions in an unnatural way. They might choose the feeling dimension to challenge them to act upon their emotions rather than react. So with your example about the father who cut off his daughter's nose, he reacted to his emotions instead of acting upon them, thinking about it, allowing his spiritual quadrant to come into play. For example, he reacted with fear, guilt, and shame <laughs> instead of uh, with all the emotions, including love, uh, in his feelings. So maybe he chose a physical body that was more feeling than thinking, and part of his challenge was to be natural, but clearly he's not. He failed. He made a mistake. So when you die, when you discarnate, you look at your life span, your government of life, and you look at it as a checklist of what you had intended to accomplish and what you did accomplish. There's no fear, guilt, and shame. There's no ego in the unobstructed. They don't have a physical body. They see things clearly. Consciousness is not obstructed by matter. Mm -hmm. So they see, they knew they could make mistakes. They know how hard it is to live on Earth. Basically, they say their, their spirit is in prison in a physical body and still trying to be balanced in this minute. So um, I go, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, again, I don't want to cut you off. I have okay. lots of questions coming to me as, as you're speaking, but they will okay, wait. So, you may answer yeah. them if you keep speaking. Yeah, so you have this checklist, and you're, you look at it uh, without the emotions we have in the physical body. You might feel regret that you didn't meet your government of life, and that will make it very easy for you. You'll decide to reincarnate. You might choose a different, different physical body, maybe one that's uh, more thinking than feeling or introverted, extroverted. You know, there'll be various reasons. Over 
incarnation to choose different physical personalities along the introversion, extroversion dimension and the thinking, feeling dimension because those physical bodies create different challenges to you. So live a rhythmic life, natural emotions in touch with your spiritual aspect. Okay, then, now, I'm going to try and wrap this up with some kind of a label process, and that may not always fit, as you know. This doesn't sound to me like the teachings that we would think of as theistic. I mean, we've already knocked out, or at least Dr. Turner knocked out, the notion that we have an omnipotent being that knows everything in advance, okay? So we're really looking at something that's more deistic, if you will. It's a form of deism. And the expression, as you and I are uh, living it right this minute in our own evolution, is contributing to uh, the experience, if you will, of what we think of as the source. Okay? That's Have I got right. that pretty the right source, up to now? The source is evolving. And right. the source okay. evolves when entities so, merge back with it. In, in process theology, and I kind of like this metaphor, and again, I'll try it on, but if it doesn't fit, you stop me. Um, you know, panentheists believe that, uh, or they, they use this analogical approach, that we are in the, uh, in the body of the source, like the cells in our body are to us as a whole. And, and, in, the, and in that sense, uh, you know, we're contributing to the well-being of the whole, the source, just as the cells contribute. And or we're perhaps not enhancing the overall nature of the source, given our behavior. Now, what you have in, in a scenario of that nature is, is a disappointment for many people who depend upon retribution as a way of correcting the evil in the world. I mean, we have evil in the world. That is the great problem of philosophy when it comes to dealing with religion. Um, so how, what are the teachings that come out of this channeling regarding, you know, what happens to the folks, the likes of which everybody turns to, like the Adolf Hitlers, uh, when they cross out of this world? Okay. Um, in the, uh, first of all, the source evolves and learns from even uh, Hitler and learns how people can behave in the obstructed. Right. But people have depended upon retribution uh, since the Egyptian oot. Uh, according to the energies, yeah, U-T-E, uh, 1 million 16,000 or 19,000 years ago. And they talk a lot about how oot invented sin, Satan and hell, because the uh, slaves believed in an afterlife. They were still spiritually connected, and they were so miserable that they chose to be beaten to death rather than be slaves. So, Oot, who the entity is described as an incredibly brilliant man, invented sin, Satan, and hell, and convinced the, the slaves that this was the nature of the source. And their purpose was to be slaves. And if they uh, did not fulfill that purpose, it was a sin. And there's a Satan who will send them to hell. So they would involve the priests, you know, other uh, powerful uh, leaders around the world learned of Ut's ideas, just like leaders today, you know, collaborate on how to mm-hmm. control the masses. And the organized religion was founded by Ooh, organized religion as we know it now, which is all based on sin, Satan, and hell. And right. if you took sin, Satan, and hell out of organized religions as we know it, what do they have to stand on? They don't talk about positive aspects of life and that you'll be forgiven and you can reincarnate, and you're not going to be punished by endless reincarnations as, you know, a code or something. You just have chances. You make mistakes. The source is forgiving. The source set up the laws and the energies involved that created reincarnation. The source knew that this earth was going to be a major challenge for spirits to get and 
get into a physical body and still live a rhythmic life. I don't know if I'm answering. No, yeah, I mean, you know, take, of course, what you've think done. Think about when, it. Take sin, Satan, and hell out of any organized yeah, religion. What you've and what done will is you've, you've eliminated all the televangelists, haven't you? Uh, <laughs> I don't watch them, but I would guess so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, now. You know, they you, do it to extract money and, control, you know, keep their existence. You've described in Oot, is that how you say it? U-T-E, yes. Oot? Okay, yes, you've described right. in Oot, um, in his creation, essentially the story that we hear is, a, is largely the Christian story, you know, you, and, and with, within some aspects of Christianity, you're not saved because of your good works, you're saved right. by the grace of God. So we, we all right. come into the world through that lens as sinners. And right. we're just miserable, pitiful, decrepit beings that if we are, you know, good enough, lucky enough, or something enough, may be saved. And you're saying this was the invention. Uh, one point, how many That's billion years ago of Oot? One million. One, one million. One million. 19,000 or 16,000, yeah. One okay, now, oh, goodness gracious, we've got a break coming up, and I've got a big question I want to ask you. Okay. Uh, when we come back from the break, you know, this is a uh, 47 billion year story, but the story itself, uh, by way of the human side of it, doesn't begin 47 billion years ago. So human, when we come, no, I'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, when we come back from the break, I'm going to ask you to give us a quick chronology, if you will, of, sure. of going through the story, um, you know, so that we know how we incorporate 47 billion years and why is it humans were the chosen to receive the gift of intelligence. And, and what does that mean with regard to animals and, and uh, our our quote in quotation marks, I should say, you know, our dominion over the beasts of the field. We'll okay. get into that and a lot more when we get back, and we'll get both uh, Dr. Turner and uh, Mr. Tim back into the show as well. We hope you're enjoying our show today. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes, and we'll take your phone calls. So don't let me dominate this. If you have questions, well, it's okay if you do let me come to think of it. If you have questions, do call in. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss what's coming up after the following messages from some of our friends. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Every day, every moment, we face choices. Yet, how many of those choices are truly our own? Are you ready to step onto the path of discovery? Read Eldon Taylor's New York Times bestseller, Choices and Illusions. Now revised, updated, and expanded. Eldon combines provocative information, scientific research, and his own life's journey into a powerful message that we have the power to change. All we must do is be willing to choose to take the chance and change. Get your copy today from all bookstores. Have you talked to yourself lately? What does that inner voice say? Are you constantly hearing negative feedback? Ready for a change? Inner talk, Eldon Taylor's patented subliminal technology, can do just that. Change your inner self-talk. Turn off the negative by replacing it with positive affirmations. Inner talk has been researched at universities such as Stanford and by governments around the world and has been proven effective at priming your self-talk. Armed with a new positive outlook, you'll find everything becomes easier. From losing weight to stop smoking, giving presentations to riding horses, learn new things to being a powerful salesperson. Choose your title for change today. Visit www.innertalk.com. That's I-N-N-E-R-T-A-L-K dot com. Innertalk dot com. And welcome back. If you just joined us, we're discussing the book 47 Billion Years of Evolution with Professor Elaine Hybe, neurosurgeon Dr. John Turner, and research historian Mr. Michael Tim. We'll take your phone calls in this half hour. Uh, it might be a little bit of a problem to get in because we've had all of our lines kind of tied up. 
but nevertheless, if you have questions of our guests, have any difficulty getting in on the phone, submit your question in our chat room. Remember, just go to uh, Provocative Enlightenment. Um, dot com forward slash chat Ravinder and her team are there to put your questions forward okay you know i was going to go a certain direction with this next half hour but the questions come flooding out of our chat room our chat room people know that uh, this is their half hour to bring questions forward and so i'm going to put the questions on the table you know I, i'm going to i'm going to what qualify it a little bit this way if i may uh, Professor Hybe, no disrespect intended, but I know Mike and I know Jack. And, oh no, uh, yeah. And when they step forward and they say, "Hey, this is this is something you want to look at. This is good. I'll do the forward on it." Uh, when Stanley Krippner says what he says, my mind opens up and I say, "Don't be a fool. Go get go get a good look at this." Of course, in that process, you know, it, it's incumbent upon a radio host, I think, or any anyone in my position in writing about it, etc., to become familiar with some of the what might be thought of as controversial subjects. Now, I've discussed this a little bit with Dr. Turner, and I wasn't sure if we'd get to it on the air or not, but when we have a question come out of the chat room, I'm just simply going to have to go to it. So... <clears throat> The question is, does Eldon believe the rumors of uh, the Barums being charlatans and their supposed involvement in sex acts with spirits, thus the reason Elizabeth Kubler-Ross distanced herself from them? I was just reading that online when I was curious about the relationships Kubler-Ross had with the Barhams. That's when I came up, when it came up, eeks. That's the question. Who wants to take that? Well, I think I, I think I can. I don't think uh, the others uh, knew personally. Uh, okay. Marty and Jay. Um, first of all, Marty and Elizabeth Cooper uh both very um, opinionated uh, people, and they had clashes, but I think they resolved that. Uh, Jay was a very uneducated man. There's, you would know instantly <laughs> that he could not uh, even create one of the sentences that the entities uh, provide. I have them on audio tape, so I've read the transcripts in the book. Uh, Jay, as a person, did not live a rhythmic life. He was out of balance. Um, he... Uh, I believe his incredible uh, ability at uh, just going into a trance and creating these materializations, being the channel, providing the essential catalyst or whatever, I think that uh, that distorted his personality, that he may have become more arrogant and engaged in inappropriate behavior uh, outside Side of the dark green, not when he was in print. Uh, so his, I would think it was his personality that uh, Elizabeth uh, couldn't accept, and he did engage in in improprieties when he was out of print. He was uh, no one, uh, to my knowledge, has any reason to question that the entities materialized when uh, Jay was in trance. The people who knew Jay when he was not in trance didn't like him very much. All right. Am Dr. I addressing? Am I addressing? Yeah, you are. You're right on. Dr. Turner, you and I discussed this and perhaps why uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross withdrew from... Uh, the group, uh, and and she is in the book, and and is one of those people that you look to and say, oh wow, if if she gave it credibility, there must have really been some here. Do you want to add anything to uh, what P- uh, Professor Hybe just uh, explained? Well, the way I understand it, the book uh, kind of explains all of what happened with uh, Doctor Kubler Ross and why she withdrew from the group, and about all these attacks and sexual allegations and. 
But as we discussed in the chat room, the whole thing boils down to this. It's not so much the messenger, but the message that's important. And just like the Bible has some important teaching points, uh, metaphysically speaking, so does this book. And that's why I think this book is really worth reading in order to try to look at the picture from an overall standpoint of we are truly all brothers and sisters, and we came from that same source. That's where we return once we've learned the lessons we come here to learn. I think that's right. why this book should be read. Mike, this one's more for you because one of the questions out of the chat room has to do with the quality of the uh, images. And it, it essentially the question says you can't really believe that these images aren't doctored, do you? Well, the, the problem is that, uh, again, as I mentioned before, the entity has to project the image into the ectoplasm. Now, some people, uh, I think the ability to do this is a lot like artistic ability. Some people can draw good images of themselves. If you ask me to draw a picture of myself, I'm going to draw a stick figure. It's about as good as I can do. Um, I relate to that. If, if you ask me to, to telepathically send a picture of myself over the telephone lines, uh, I, I probably will send you a picture uh, resembling a photograph that was taken of me 50 years ago, and I was much thinner and, and younger. Um, not the picture I see of myself when I'm shaving. Um, when I think of my deceased brother, he died about 30 years ago, I, I picture him in his high school graduation photo. I don't picture him at some moment in time. So h how we get these pictures of ourselves and then project them to somebody else is is the, is the problem. And you know, a lot of the um, projections were, were partial. Sometimes only a face would appear, sometimes a hand would appear, and that had to do with the strength of the medium. Mediums come in different abilities, just like uh, the, the example I used recently in, in an article is like baseball players. I mean, you can get uh, Albert Pujols, who can, you know, hit 333 every season, and you can get ball players who, who hit 200. There, there's a difference in the ability of these players, the, the ability to... Uh, their their gift or their power, whatever it is, just comes in different degrees, just like baseball players. And you know, the same thing with the light. I mean, some mediums require complete darkness because they don't have that much power. Some can do it under red light because they have a little bit more power. And some, a very few, Daniel uh, D. Hume, who was considered the, probably the top medium of the 19th century, could do it in in subdued light. Uh, he was just a stronger medium. Uh, so it's a matter of degree. Matter of degree. And that, that would explain why the photo doesn't look like a, a photo of, you know, you or I standing there with the day's photography. Right. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Back to you then, Professor Hybe. And where I was, I'm going to ignore some of these other questions for a minute, where I was before the break. Give us a quick overview, if you will, 47 billion years ago, what happened? When was consciousness deposited in human beings? What are the ramifications? Please bring that forward. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, the source conducted experiments. And 47 billion years ago, uh, he conducted an experiment. Uh, where now, you created, use the word he. Do, do you mean uh, he? Sure, I mean, no, I'm sorry. It, okay, all right. That's my old, <laughs> I know. Old <laughs> I know. I'm old school, too. But... <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I used it in the book. Um, it created an experiment that resulted in seven galaxies. And in three of them, uh, the galaxies, uh, they had one planet uh, whose conditions were conducive to the form of life the source was interested in creating. So the source monitored, you know, with other uh, entities, monitored these seven galaxies, but monitored the three planets, one in each of three galaxies, uh, as to when they've evolved uh, materially to support uh, life. And then 47 million years ago, the source created life, all life, including the human creature, the human animal was just an instinctual animal like any other animal. For as 47 million years ago, this is. The source monitored how every form of life evolved. Uh, seven million years ago, 
the source selected the human creature as being the most amenable to having a higher quantity and quality of consciousness for a spirit to endow it. You know, the physical brain was conducive, the uh, human animal creature uh, capable of living in a wide range of environments. Seems like the most uh, adaptable animal. The source considered eight uh, gorillas chose the human animal uh, as being more adaptive than those others, more adapted to survive in a wider range of conditions. So seven million years ago, uh, human beings uh, worldwide were endowed with a soul worldwide. This created some uh, shake-up because, uh, the, of course, the endowment was in newborns. And here there were parents with children who were much smarter than them, had more intellect, wide range of emotions rather than just positive, negative emotions. They had all these emotions I listed before, uh, you know, like jealousy. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, the spiritual part that they're connected. Mm -hmm. And human beings are given a lot of intention, like what fruit or plant, you know, is safe to eat, what's medicinal, at what level is it medicinal rather than poisonous. Uh, survival mechanisms uh, were intense. The original endowed human was very psychic, very open to spiritual attention. It was uh, just a natural form of life, like accepting gravity. Uh, and if you're a human a a being now, I'll say, who's endowed with a soul seven million years ago, lived rhythmically. And then about four million years ago, the entities used the biblical story of Cain and Abel uh, as a metaphor, uh, and that this was going on worldwide, that suddenly the, uh, the way they that present it is that tribal leaders, some of them were, um, uh, had brain damage, were senile, and got out of balance. And the Cain and Abel story represents that. Cain didn't kill Abel, they say. Abel fell. Uh, the father comes seeing Cain all anguished, and in his senility, Cain couldn't explain to his father what happened. Uh, so his father had communicated him from the tribe that had never happened before. If there was somebody out of balance in the tribe, they'd have the person live on the edge of the tribe. They'd still take care of the person but they wouldn't be excommunicated. So this notion of excommunication uh, induced a sense of guilt and shame uh, that people never felt before, this distorted derivative of, of fear, unnatural fear. Guilt and shame being excommunicated from your tribe, shame being blamed for violating a universal law of natural behavior. You don't show another person uh, intentionally only out of self-defense with you. So this be was a deterioration in rhythmic living four million years ago. Uh, slavery ended up being a result of that. This uh, notion that you can kill somebody, that you can be excommunicated. Cain was excommunicated. People like Cain <laughs> worldwide were. Uh, and they were distorted and out of balance, out of rhythm and created slavery. So the next major event after that, uh, the Cain and Abel uh, metaphor for a million years ago, the next big event I mentioned already, one million, nineteen thousand years ago, when this Egyptian ruler, he was not uh, any messiah or anything, and he was a ruler who tried to come up with how to solve the slavery uh, rebellion problem. Really, it wasn't a rebellion. It was like a sit-down. They mm -hmm. just stopped working and allowed themselves to kill because they knew the afterlife and they could reincarnate if they want. <laughs> so that's when uh, Uth, 
who over a million years ago created sin, Satan, and hell as a way to control the masses. You can't, so, you know, so the slaves would work right. for Ut, who was a ruler. And uh, other rulers, of course, picked up on this great idea. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I went through that too quickly. No, you know, that's that's really good. Now, I'm going to ask you a couple questions about what you just went through. I mean, first thing that occurs to me is there's a great deal of correspondence between the notion of seven million years and seven thousand years and seven days, and these are stories that we hear common to theological, you know, well, the seven million even out, the seven to the theological nature of the creation of of the earth, okay? I mean, supposedly everything was created maybe 7,000 years ago. <clears throat> is there any days. meaning? <laughs> and in seven days, the Lord created it all, right? Is there any any meaning to that correspondence? Uh, not that the entities explain, uh, but you're right. It's 47 billion years ago, created the galaxies, 47 million life, uh, 7 million endowments. And there's also seven levels of spiritual evolution. So right. the, you're right about this number seven, but they didn't explain uh, the meaning of number seven. Okay, let me but, ask you know, the I omitted two major, uh, uh, three major things about the after ooh. If May I throw those please. in? Please, yeah, please, yes. Okay, so uh, things deteriorated so much, the source decided it wanted to do another experiment. And it requested two entities. It requested entities that had merged with it. When you merge, you don't. The entity doesn't lose its identity. Uh, anyway, when you merge with the source, you no longer need to reincarnate in terms of meeting the challenges of living in the physical. But uh, the source tried an experiment with Buddha. Buddha chose to uh, reincarnate, and you know he emphasized for people to get more in touch with their soul, their spiritual quadrant, uh, to be non-judgmental and accepting, uh, to get over fear, guilt, and shame, which the negativity, revolution against negativity. Buddha had a great influence. The notion of karma has been distorted as punishment and reward. That's not how the universal laws work. Uh, you evolve. You learn from mistakes. You're not punished. Or rewarded. So Buddha has a lot of influence uh, in the East. Uh, the source wanted yet another experiment to influence the West. So Jesus uh, came forth as willing to incarnate again. He chose the Middle East because the Roman Empire and all the roads, his teachings could be easily spread. And of course they were. Uh, so there was Jesus, there's a long uh, part of the book of what happened to uh, Christianity uh, after Jesus' teachings being distorted in organized religion, adopting a lot of huge concepts in Satan and hell. So there was the Jesus ex uh, experiment, and then there's now, with psychic mediums popping up all over the place. We're in an experiment that might be, the entities wouldn't say. But before Buddha and before Jesus, a lot of uh, people were impinged upon to accept a very special person. Uh, we're now being uh, made comfortable with the idea of mediumship and psychics on TV and movies, books on the Internet. Uh, people becoming more accustomed to this idea. So this, this current experiment might just be a lot of medium, but we might also be in a, in a phase where we're being prepared to accept mediums, unlike now where they're called a flaw, they do something is wrong, like Jay Barnum, you know, did some inappropriate behavior when he was not in trance. You know, latching onto that, trying to discredit psychics and mediums. So we got a way to go. And for these individuals to not be diagnosed as 
schizophrenic or having some mental disorder, but seen as normal people and admired people with a very valid talent that's accepted and utilized. Whether or not that's it or whether or not we're in a stage of being prepared for a great psychic to incarnate that will have massive influence worldwide, I'm not clear on that. The entities weren't clear. Uh, but they insinuated that there would be a third uh, psychic, a uh, third after uh, Buddha and Jesus, I mean, Buddha a third. Jesus. Yeah, that will uh, incarnate and have a massive amount of influence. I you know, how that will happen. I would assume it'll use the internet. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the way everything is today, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, right. They'll register uh, a domain with ICANN. No. Okay, right. Listen. Right. <laughs> I, I have to ask you a couple things. I mean. First of all, you, in the beginning, you know, we have the source, you know, I mean, and all the creation epics are that, and, you know, the Big Bang uh, theory, you know, in the beginning there's right. nothing, and then from no thing we get everything, all right. But I thought I heard you say that when the source created the constellations and the planets, that he had counselors. He, and then I'm using that word inappropriate, it, had counselors, had advisors, does that mean there's more than one source? I mean, I'm reminded of a Mormon uh, principle. I believe it goes something like, as uh, God or as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. Do we have some kind of evolution of that nature implied in what you're talking about? Well, the in terms of advisors to the source? Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. you know, uh, where do the advisors to the source come from? They are entities who have evolved to the seventh level uh, of evolution. But, but They've they not yet ev- merged with the source. Oh, I they, see. So they were they created have, before the 47 billion years of creation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is nothing. The 47 billion years, that's just our galaxy. Okay. All others. right. There are many, so, many other galaxies and experiments going on in the universe that the entities you know, okay. indicated exist. But <laughs> All right, and, and, and we're just, and i got so many more questions, but we're flat out of time, and I want all three of you to be able to, you know, take enough time to tell everybody how they can find out more about you. Uh, Mike, I, you know, you be sure and tell everybody about where your blog is. I read it. Uh, it's the only blog I read religiously, but I want all of you to have that opportunity. Let's begin with you, Professor uh, Hybe. How does anybody, everybody, reach out to you, learn more about what it is that you do, learn more about 47 billion years of evolution? Uh, well, you mentioned the Facebook page, the Facebook page, Evolution and uh, Spirituality. Plus, we have a page dedicated to the book, 47 Billion Years of Evolution, uh, case report. That okay. case report is important. And right. that the website is just 47billionyears.com. All right, real quickly, we got about 15 seconds, Jack. Um, you know, I'm no big thing here, but I would suggest everyone read this book. But for my work... My website, johnlturner.com. But, again, the importance is the message in this book, and I suggest right. everyone try uh, to and, this. And, Mr. Tim, yours. Yeah, I, I would just say go to White Crow Books. Google White Crow Books, and you can find out you know, my books and other books there. And I think very highly of uh, both, uh, well, of all three of these people. So you have my recommendation, too. Uh, all right, we've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank our guests and all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show, and we'll join us again next week, same time and same place. And tell your friends. See, let's get them involved as well. All right, remember, uh, wherever you are in the world, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.